So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our speakers. Um, we have eight fabulous speakers for tonight. Uh, and so they are in alphabetical order. Uh, first, we have Berta Campos Anaceti. She is the Director of Latina Services uh, uh, at North Marin Community Services. She has a master's degree in public health from UC Berkeley and over 30 years of experience working with um, Latin and low income young people and their families. An immigrant from El, El Salvador at age 16, she has focused her career and volunteer work on human rights and the health and wellness of immigrants, in particular, Latin and low income communities. We have Francis Collins, a nationally known physi physician and geneticist. Uh, he is the former director of the National Institutes of Health, the leader of the Human Genome Project, and the author of The Language of God. Uh, he has also asked us to make clear that he's here tonight in his own capacity, not speaking on behalf of an institution. Next, we have Lincoln Earl Centers, who is the Braver Angels State Coordinator for Vermont. He is married, the father of two high school boys and a daughter in elementary school. An ISA certified arborist, Lincoln owns and runs a small tree care company in central Vermont. Then we have Ari Schulman, who is the editor of the fascinating journal, The New Atlantis, I, I said that, he didn't, um, a technology and society journal. His work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, National Affairs, and The Atlantic, and he has previously worked in the opinion department at the New York Times. We have Jerry Silberman, who is, is semi-retired from a career as a factory worker and then a labor organizer in healthcare. Very interesting. Uh, Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford is a fellowship trained obesity medicine physician scientist, internist, and pediatrician at Massachusetts General Hospital and an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. She is the director of equity for the endocrine division at Massachusetts General Hospital. Next, we have Matt Willis, who, Dr. Matt Willis, who is the county public health officer for Marin County in California. He calls on experience as a physician, an epidemiologist, and a member of the community to guide public health strategy for Marin. He has also worked for the Indian Health Service on the Navajo Reservation and at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, where he conducted research and outbreak investigations in the US and abroad. And last but not least, we have Wilk Wilkinson, who has more than 22 years in the uh, experience in the transportation industry and is currently a distribution manager for a Midwestern welding supply distributor. He is a husband, father, and the creator host of the Derate the Hate podcast. So I'd like everybody to give a big round of jazz hands for an excellent, excellent panel tonight. And just so you know, I'm positive that everybody at home is doing this too. So you can't see them, but they are giving you jazz hands. And uh, so, like I said, I think this will be really special. And um, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna call this debate to order. On resolved, public health decisions should be made by experts, not by ordinary citizens. We'll take a first speech in the affirmative from Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins, go ahead and unmute. You have five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good evening to all of you. Yes, I am here in my personal capacity. I'm gonna tell two stories, but also try to make some points from my perspective as a physician and a scientist who had the opportunity to lead the National Institutes of Health for 12 years. The personal story for, about my own experience dates back to November of 2020. That was, of course, in the throes of the worst of COVID-19, where we were desperately needing interventions, therapeutics, and especially vaccines. Many of us working 100-hour weeks were doing everything possible to accelerate the process of developing and then rigorously testing the vaccines that might save lives. And there was a certain evening where the results of a very large-scale trial uh, of the vaccines were going to be revealed because they had been blinded up until that point. I didn't dare to really hope that the results would be all that good because most vaccines fail. But when the results were unveiled, the efficacy of this vaccine turned out to be 95%, well in excess of anything that any of us had dared to hope for. And the safety record was remarkably good. And I will tell you quite honestly, I cried that night and I also gave thanks because this was an answer to prayer. And I thought there in November of 2020, we're going to lick this virus. We're going to be able to send it packing. And this, I think, will be seen as one of the great science triumphs of our generation because this happened in just 11 months. But then what happened? People did get vaccinated, but a lot of other people didn't. My next personal story comes from August of 2021. 
not that long ago. It's about a young man named Josh Tidmore, 36 years old. He and his wife, Christina, in Alabama, wondered whether they should sign up for this vaccine or not. They were members of an evangelical church founded by Christina's grandfather. And there was a lot of skepticism about whether this was something that was really important or not, and they were young and healthy. And so they've decided to pass this up, especially after they saw some social media postings that made it sound like maybe this wasn't safe after all. Unfortunately, then they both got sick. Christina got well pretty quickly, but Josh got sicker and sicker, ending up in the ICU. And then sadly, with a great uh, tragic experience here, uh, his wife had to watch him uh, succumb to this disease at just age 36, uh, leaving her with two small children. Christina, seeing what had happened, looking at the evidence about vaccines, then became really an ambassador to try to get others to take advantage of this, only to find that many people attacked her uh, for the information she was trying to ch share, including people in their own church. The Kaiser Family Foundation has estimated there are 160,000 people like Josh who have lost their lives since last June because of decisions not to take advantage of a life-saving vaccine. That's a pretty concrete fact figure, 162,000 people in graveyards. And many of them are evangelical Christians, as was the case here. I'm an evangelical Christian. This is particularly troubling. Uh, after all, the words from Jesus, the truth will set you free. Naively, I thought all we had to do was figure out the scientific truth, tell people about it. It would be embraced and people would do the things that the truth would tell you to do. But obviously, we failed. 50 million people in the United States are still unvaccinated even now. So what happened here? Public health officials had the truth, but they didn't have the trust. We, as public health officials, I don't think fully explained the nature of science, that science is always looking to try to get better, that knowledge is always going to increase. And that means recommendations are going to change as new discoveries happen and as this virus evolved from its original form to Delta and now to Omicron. On top of that suspicion of the government, social media misinformation and disinformation, and a lot of politics overtook the truth, making it hard for honorable people to figure out what to believe. And so the truth basically uh, had a hard time competing uh, with all those other messages. What do I think happened here? Well, clearly public health does need to be based on science. I will defend that in terms of the resolution that we have. And I also think though that that kind of decision-making about public health should be as inclusive as possible with people who understand what the consequences are going to be of those decisions. And for that, we need to empower community voices. We did some of that during COVID in this terrible rush at NIH. We had something called the Community Engagement Alliance that brought into this effort to share information, community leaders who had the trust of those communities more than some old white guy like me who works for the government would be likely to be able to achieve. Pastors, I spent a lot of my time in podcasts with pastors trying to encourage leaders of the faith also to share this information with their flocks. So I support the resolution about the need for public health decisions to be made by experts, but we need to be more inclusive. And finally, the communication of the message needs to engage trusted voices who have the ability uh, to put across messages to people who will look at those particular individuals and say, yeah, that's somebody I can believe in, somebody I can trust. Truth is not enough. We've got to have trust. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. OK, yes, jazz hands for our brave first speaker. Thank you, everybody. Um, and I like the thumbs up, Ari. That works. Ari, forgive me. Um, and so uh, as is always the case, we will now do questions. So for each uh, speaker, they'll receive a few questions. And uh, so panelists, as I, am, I believe I may have told you, just go ahead and raise your hand visually if you have a question for the speaker. And for those of you who are attendees, there is a link in your chat uh, so that you can submit questions through the form. So we will start with a question from Aaron from Colorado. He wants to know, his question is, Madam Chair, how do experts change policy once new evidence becomes available? Go ahead. What a great question. And that is something that public health experts must do 
And I think you want them to do. And yet it's also the kind of thing that I think has generated in the public some distrust about why are they telling me this when two months ago they told me that. I often think it's useful to compare this to other situations where you depend on experts for advice. If you have a stockbroker and you say to your stockbroker, should I invest in this stock or not? And they say yes uh, today. And then you ask them a month later, do you expect them to always say yes? No, sometimes they're going to say not. No, don't do it because the data has changed. Well, public health data changes as well. Public health experts are therefore obligated to do that, even though they realize sometimes that it sounds like what a politician would call flip-flopping. It's not flip-flopping. It's trying to go with the best evidence you have at that time. All right, great. Uh, our next question will come from, was that a jazz hand area or a question? It was a question, okay. Um, Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Sure. So, I, um, Madam Speaker, I'm wondering if um, Dr. Collins, in his former role, can speak at all to uh, were there elements of the, the frayed relationship between public health leaders and the and the public that didn't have to do simply with information communication or with who the messengers were? Do you think there were any actual? Does he think? Uh, I'm sorry. Does he does he think that there were any actual? Um, missteps, anything that might have merited mistrust on behalf of the public. Hmm. All right. Oh, sure. Uh, I don't think we were always consistent with the different voices that were trying to make recommendations to the public. Uh, there was an effort to do so. I was part of that team and uh, the people who were part of that communications effort met very regularly, but occasionally people went off script and it just sounded like, what? I made a pretty colossal mistake myself one time on CNN and had to backtrack just because you're in the heat of the moment and you say something that you later think, oh, that wasn't right. Uh, the public health communicators are human too and mistakes got made. And sometimes people were looking to make something of that and they could always find it if they looked hard enough. All right. Um, and then our final question is from Tracy Hollister, Wilmington, North Carolina. She wants to know, she says, Madam Chair, there are over 26,000 COVID vaccine deaths and over 1.2 million adverse reactions, according to the CDC's own VAERS data, which is known to be underreported. How does this square with health officials saying that the vaccines are, quote, safe and effective? Well, Tracy, that's just a wonderful question, and I'm glad you asked it, because this is a source, I think, of a great deal of concern and confusion. That database that you refer to is one that, that she refers to. Mm -hmm that she referred to. There you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it is um, one that anybody can deposit information if something happens after a vaccine uh, in order for the FDA to get a sense, is there something going on here? Recognize though now with some 200 million vaccines having been delivered to 200 million people, that there are gonna be instances where somebody gets vaccinated and for totally unrelated reasons, uh, some medical event happens in the next couple of weeks. That doesn't mean cause and effect. Almost always it won't be cause and effect, but it will get reported. So if you're trying to figure out what's cause and effect, look at the actual rigorous trials that were done of the vaccines where 30,000 people volunteered and bless them for that. And half of them got the vaccine and half of them got a placebo and then look to see where there's a higher risk of side effects in the people who got the vaccine compared to the placebo. The answer was with that very large number, no. There were some very rare side effects that turned up later that were quite real, but they're in the order of one to 10,000, one to 100,000, that myocarditis thing you might've heard about. But go to VAERS with great deal of skepticism. Most of what's reported there probably had nothing to do with the vaccine. It just was a medical event that happened. We wanna know about it. Correlation doesn't mean causation. That's a famous epidemiology statement, and it really applies here. Be very concerned. Don't let people tell you, oh, well, that proves all those people had a bad vaccine reaction. Most of them did not. All right. And with that, the speaker is thanked. One more round of jazz hands for excellent questions and, and very good answers as well. Yes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Collins. We will now go to Mr. Wilkinson. Uh, sorry, to Wilk. He says he prefers actually just Wilk. Um, so Wilk, you have five minutes. Go ahead and, and go ahead, unmute. Well, thank you, first of all, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. I, I just wanna say how honored I am to be part of such a great group here uh, this evening. And uh, 
I'm incredibly grateful for all the people that have taken the time out of their evening to participate and, and watch this because I think it's incredibly important what uh, what we're doing here because we have as a country lost an incredible amount of trust in uh, our public health leaders in our government um, and a lot of that has been the result of the government's reaction to this pandemic. So I look first at everything through the lens of liberty. And because of that, because of, you know, because of liberty and, and people's desire for liberty, we created here in the United States the best country that has ever, that has produced more freedom, more opportunity, more greatness for more people than any other country on this planet in the history of mankind. And that can only be done, that can only be done with a government that trusts the people and the people trusting the government. Okay. So with that said, a lot of people have said at times I may be an anti-government person. I'm not anti-government. I'm anti-big over intrusive government. And, and that's what we saw during this pandemic. During this pandemic, we saw the government lay down a heavy hand on the people of this country in a way that they've never done at any other time in our history. And that to a lot of people like me, just reeked of tyranny. It hurt personally, it hurt us as individuals because Government has no rights. Government has responsibility. And government's first responsibility is to protect the rights of the individual. In this case, they trampled the rights of the individual. Now, we all as individuals in a free country do have some sort of obligation to do the right thing in most, you know, in most cases. But what we saw during this pandemic based on the advice and counsel of organizations like the CDC and the National Institute of Health, we saw politicians take advantage of a situation and take greater control over the lives of individuals than they ever have. We saw hospitals shut down for months when they had never even seen a COVID case. Um, we saw outstate people I, I, in, in the state in which I live, Minnesota, our governor treated the whole state, most of the state is rural, treated the whole state as if it was Minneapolis, St. Paul Metro. Now, all of the cases for the first several months of this pandemic were confined to the metro area. Yet businesses and hospitals, individuals were not allowed to leave their homes um, unless it was an emergency situation. When many of these people, again, for months and months and months, never saw a single case, never had any interaction with anybody that had COVID. We saw businesses, little mom and pop shops. You know, the vast majority of this country is made up of small businesses. Many of those small businesses that politicians out of fiat decided were non-essential. Those businesses were not allowed to open. And those lives and livelihoods, some of them, businesses that people had saved up their whole lives to start were destroyed. The government's answer was to print money and throw it at the situation. Did no good. Temporary stop gap measures, but it destroyed those businesses, destroyed those restaurants. Again, I go back to the idea that our government is there to protect the lives and livelihoods, the freedoms, the liberties, of the individual in this country, not to trample them. And, and that's what we saw. Now, I, I do believe that our government plays a role in the research and development and, and understanding of infectious diseases. I do agree because in a conversation I've had with my good friend here that, that we spoke about that's not the sexy part of medicine. That's not the thing that most people are just going to start throwing money at and do on their own volition. Those things, it's very important for the government to do. 
because it's not probably going to get done if not done by a government. And there is a common good there. And I do agree with that. And then I do agree that they should be advice and counsel, those organizations, but they are non-elected officials that do not have the power and should not have the power of the force of government. Government is the only entity with a monopoly on force. And when they start to use that monopoly on force to do what people in the country do not want to do, they start to destroy the trust that is required between the government and the individual. All right. Spectacular. Uh, jazz hands for our brave first negative. All right, yes. And the thumbs up, that's okay, Ari. I accept that. Um, and, all right, so let's go ahead and move to questions. I see Dr. Collins. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, the speaker, my friend Oak, uh, has made a very good point about the way in which public health recommendations have sometimes been applied in ways that did great economic harm uh, to individuals. Um, does the speaker think that was primarily because the public health system was misguided or that the politicians uh, took their recommendations and applied them in an irrational way? All right, go ahead, Wilk. I do believe that the government and the politicians and the media in large part played a huge part in mis um, misapplying, I, I can't remember the word uh, uh, the former uh, speaker used, but used, used that advice and counsel and used it in, in, uh, in, in a lot of times, I believe they used it in a nefarious way, but very much so on the media's part and, and certain politicians, absolutely. All right. Uh, this is a question from Richard Aberdeen from Nashville, Tennessee. He wants to know, he says, Madam Chair, does the speaker believe that caring about your neighbor's health could be more important than your personal liberty? Go ahead. I would say that, again, I look through everything through the lens of liberty first. Caring about my neighbor's health is by all rights and by all means the right thing to do. I do. But in order for me to surrender my liberties, I have to understand, I have to have definitive proof that something I'm going to do when I surrender my liberties is going to actually positively affect their health. All right. Uh, and then a related question, a couple of folks have questions for you like this. So let's sort of build on that with a question from Susan Scott from Salem, Oregon. She'd like to know, Madam Chair, how does the speaker balance the importance of the respective individual rights to life versus liberty? That is, when can the government take steps to preserve individual lives, even if it limits freedom? I think if the government can make a definitive case that something I am going to do as an individual is going to adversely affect somebody else's life, as an individual and make a definitive case for that, then they can make that case and ask my permission. I, I, I do not believe that the government, again, the government has no rights. They only have responsibility. The government, when they decide to destroy the life or livelihood of one person to positively affect another person has now overstepped their bounds, has now overstepped that bond of trust that the individual has with their government. All right, and with that, the speaker is thanked. Jazz hands once again for good questions and good answers. I like that you gave yourself jazz hands. Everybody should do that. All right, uh, and, um, for, uh, we will now take a speech in the affirmative uh, and I'd like to call on Dr. Uh, Fatima Cody Stanford. Go ahead, Madam unmute Chief. you have five minutes. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, thank you so much. Um, 220 million adults have overweight and obesity in this country. 110 million have the disease of obesity. 
By far, this is the largest chronic disease of our time, but it was only in 2013 when the American Medical Association acknowledged it as a disease. Now, what most people still believe about this disease that we call obesity is that it is a choice. It is a situation where a person decides that they will just be lazy, inactive, and it's those biases that drive our thoughts, our decisions about this disease that come not only from the public at large, but also come from us as experts. This is problematic, particularly in the context of COVID-19. The number one risk factor in terms of disease processes with regards to both morbidity, i.e. sickness, and death regarding COVID-19 was the disease of obesity. And just to give a little bit of an explanation about this disease that I keep naming that, is that this is a complex multifactorial disease regulated by none other than our brains. The hypothalamus gets signals from different parts of our bodies to tell us not only how much to eat, but how much to store. But we know that these numbers are vast. There is no other disease process in our history, in this country or elsewhere, where we can name the numbers that I was just able to do, yet we neglect it. Currently, only 1% of individuals that meet criteria for medications for the treatment of this disease in this country get it. About 2% get surgical intervention, so that means 3% get the, the treatment that we know is based on the evidence and the science that actually would treat the brain, the organ that governs this disease. Now, when we talk about racial and ethnic minorities and the disproportionate rise in obesity within those communities, I think we have to go back and look at the context of the BMI or the body mass index. And the BMI is what we utilize to determine one's weight status. A person is considered to have normal weight status. Their BMI is between 18 and a half and 24.9. A normal weight status, um, we get above that into overweight status, 25 to 29.9. And then we get into those three classes of obesity, mild, moderate, and severe, mild obesity being classified as a BMI of 30 to 34.9, moderate, a BMI of 35 to 39.9, and those with severe obesity, a BMI greater than 40. The problem with BMI is that BMI is a screening tool, not a diagnostic tool. And what I must let you know is that the BMI that we currently use today is based upon Metropolitan Life Insurance Table data from the 1930s and 1940s where individuals that were descendants of the enslaved, like myself as a Black woman physician scientist born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, were not included. Yet, the guidelines by which we govern one's weight status, not only as a diagnostic, or as a diagnostic tool, is by far reflected by the BMI. What I can tell you is that we know that there's disproportionate impact on communities of color despite the flaws in BMI. And we do know that as particularly racial and ethnic minorities in this community, that we do not receive the same treatment. A lot of that's reflected on who's taking care of individuals. Studies from the American Medical Association and the AAMC, which is the American Association of Medical Colleges, demonstrate that black doctors are more likely to care for black patients and more likely to care for individuals in low socioeconomic status. But the number of Black doctors in this country has only changed by 4%, yes, one, two, three, four percent in the last 120 years. So we have these potential for experts to really have an impact on the community, but we're not even allowed to do that. And it was the Flexner Report in 1910 that closed all Black medical schools because as a Black individual in 1910, you were not allowed to attend PWI or predominantly white institutions. That didn't come into the late, later portion of the 1900s. Now, when we look at this idea of who can deliver care and who will receive the messaging, it's about who's at the table. And we have to have our experts involved, but we have to have, as was mentioned previously, we have to have the experts within the community because the messaging can't be the same from one community to the next but you need to have the expertise to be able to explain that hypothalamic regulation of weight based upon our obesogenic environment that has led us to the greatest pandemic of our time, which is that of obesity. Thank you. All right, jazz hands for our wonderful doctor who apparently knows everything about obesity. It's making me wonder about BMI, but anyway, um, 
Lovely. So I'm now looking for questions. And let's take one from the panel first. Um, Jerry, go ahead and unmute, ask your question to me. I think you need to unmute. I would ask the doctor how she sees the role of our uh, modern industrial food industry and its unlimited advertising uh, and promotion of unhealthy diets uh, as a cause of obesity. And where, uh, where do you address that? Where does she in, address that? Where does she address that in the uh, uh, fight against it? All right, go ahead. Madam Chair, in response to um, the speaker, um, I would like to state that we unfortunately, due to our limited education, conflate obesity and nutrition status. While nutrition does play a role in weight and weight status, we know that the largest contributor to the major issues that we've seen, particularly during this pandemic, was stress. Stress causes a rise in cortisol, a rise in CRP or C-reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. With that increase causes greater storage of adipose, the organ that is fat. And so when we look at these issues, we forget or negate the over a hundred different issues that cause this disease of obesity. While nutrition does play a role, if we really dig deep and look at the impact in our community, it's somewhere in the order of 10 to 20%. Things like genetics, development, environment, behavior, stress, racism, all of these are causative factors that we often neglect as we try to assume that there's a unidirectional relationship between just food and obesity. When I see, have seen over 10,000 patients in my time that have obesity, of which food is often optimized, but the way they store their food is not. So that would be my response in relation to the speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, very good. Um, so we're now gonna take a question from uh, Leslie from San Francisco. Um, she says, Madam Chair, messaging about obesity and about masks and vaccines often seems very personally judgmental and critical. How can experts or the folks who really know something about this better reach and also hear the target audience? Oh, absolutely. I absolutely love this question because I think it gets into one of my other favorite topics, which I didn't have time to address, which is this idea, for example, of weight bias. And we know weight bias is reflected even in how we talk about this disease of obesity. For example, the use of the word morbid in relation to obesity. We don't call it morbid cancer. We don't call it mor morbid COVID-19, even though that's gonna be a lot of our focus. We don't call it morbid heart disease, yet we call it morbid obesity. Even the term obese is stigmatizing. Obesity is a disease, obese is a label. So patients with obesity, and notice I didn't use the word obese until just answering your question. We need to listen to the communities. And yesterday, as I talked to a woman who was over 450 pounds as a patient. She thanked me for starting our conversation with the messaging that I will not refer to her by a label, but rather learn strategies, teach her about strategies that we can use to treat her disease. Similarly, I think we should do the same with masking. So thank you so much for that question. Wonderful, wonderful. And for a final question, um, this is from Chandler from Houston. Uh, he says, Madam Chair, how would the speaker suggest we assess uh, different facts, in quotes, that we hear? As an example, there have been studies with varying results about benefits of masking, including some that are criticized by reputable scientists. How do we know what science to follow? Absolutely. I think in these situations where we have conflicting studies, one of the key things that we use in science um, is something called a meta-analysis, where we pull together multiple studies and we can look across let's say 20, 30, 50, 100 studies, and see what was the pervasive conclusion based upon multiple studies. And so with regards to masking and things of that sort, that's a great um, potential strategy. Also something that we call a systematic review, where we may not necessarily be comparing all the studies and getting the numbers, but we can see what does the literature tell us about all the studies that have ever been conducted on a particular topic. And so when we look at the level of evidence from a meta-analysis or a systematic review or pooling together multiple studies, you can imagine that that raises significantly the level of confidence that we might have in what the data shows. All righty, very good. With that, the speaker is thanked. Good questions and good answers once again. Excellent, all right. Um, so we're now going to a speech in the negative. 
and we will go to Mr. Jerry Silverman. Jerry, go ahead and unmute. You have five minutes. Um, I'm, I'm still unmuted. Um, you are, beautiful. <laughs> okay, so our question for debate references experts and ordinary citizens, but it doesn't define what they are. So we need to have a definition. Experts are individuals, here's the definition. Experts are individuals with a thorough understanding, documented experience in the theory and practice of a specific field of knowledge. They have the ability to explain in plain English the basis on which we should credit their references, their suggestions, and also explain the limits of their expertise. Experts are also ordinary citizens with the same emotions, strengths, weaknesses, psychology, and vulnerabilities as everyone else. As a matter of self-justification, they may overrate the importance of their expertise and forget that it has a social context. Thousands of experts work in synchrony in different areas to keep our society function. I'm willing to bet that half the people on this call at least consider themselves an expert in some field and will look askance at a layman questioning their judgment. Thousands of cells in our body, very specialized and amazing, each one, every one necessary, none viable by themselves together produce an amazing creature. Experts are very temporary until their view is proven wrong or incomplete. Being human, one who is an ex established expert based on certain knowledge is very likely to be resistant to their truth being superseded. But that supersession is how science progresses. And experts are subject to corruption like anyone else based on money, pride, and power. Uh, I was about 26 years old when the AIDS epidemic hit and nobody got it right least of all our public health experts who um, for political reasons were unwilling to challenge uh, behaviors that were spreading the disease, uh, who um, the experts in charge of our blood supply declared in 1981 that AIDS couldn't possibly be transmitted by transfusion, despite the fact that there was already evidence to that effect long before the virus had been identified. And they sentenced thousands of hemophiliacs to death most of whom of course were not gay. Um, Robert Gallo, a major leader in the NIH at that time, who was very jealous about having discovered a retrovirus, insisted that HIV was part of his virus, delayed for almost a year and a half the acknowledgement of the distinct nature of that virus. Again, delaying care, treatment, and understanding of the disease. Um, it wasn't until it was very clear that what had already happened had condemned thousands of people in this country to death that the NIH started to actually consider it a disease worthy of investigation. And there's still no epi there's still no vaccine for AIDS. It's endemic. It can be managed now, but people, lots of people still die from AIDS every year in this country. We can all think of confident statements from experts which have been proven wrong. And in, in this epidemic, um, the evidence of the vaccines is that lots of people are dying now of COVID who had who have been vaccinated. The, the, the discussion didn't, the discussion stopped from a public point view. In my view, the discussion on that stopped when the vaccine was announced. And every any evidence that has been raised, including the short-term effects of the vaccine, has been minimized or censored because there's there's a, a buy-in to that miraculous solution, which clearly hasn't been a solution. As society has grown in complexity, the idea that experts ought to have decisive authority to manage societal and public policy has gained a, gate, has gained a great deal of support from elected officials of both parties. It's a way to avoid public debate and say something is right or wrong, not simply what is our position on this. In any challenge facing society, so ordinary citizens, I'll, I'll reference what Mr. Wilk said, ordinary citizens have a means, a, the government that is supposed to serve us before the experts are consulted and make their suggestions about what are the solutions. There has to be a public discussion and evaluation of what are our social goals? What are the costs? We have to do a full and open and transparent risk benefit analysis. And that risk benefit analysis does not include only 
an expert's concern that maybe I can save a life by doing this. It has to concern all of the other impacts on society of, of the lockdowns of isolation, um, the economic harm, um, the actual risk to people, um, all of those things have to be considered. They were not considered, at least from a public, from as a member of the public, there was no discussion of this. And the story that we were told changed constantly. Every time it got wrong, it changed a little bit. Remember, we were just gonna have a six week lockdown to flatten the curve. Remember that message? So um, when I say that, this, that there has to be a public transparent discussion that's led by, that has to come through the people's government, a lot of folks are gonna roll their eyes and oh my God, our government's so polarized, politicians are so corrupt. How are we gonna have a public process like that? That's great, that you're works? close on time. So I'm gonna ask okay. you to wrap up, but it's um, really good, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the bottom line is that expertise is not a shortcut for democracy, even when it may be attractive because it offers quick solutions that we really want to hear. All right, jazz hands for our passionate speaker. Thank you, love it. Um, so let's start with a question from Dr. Willis. Go ahead, unmute and ask your question to me. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and the speaker um, made an excellent point, I think, about the need for a wider frame around setting policies um, that was met with many jazz hands um, around um, integrating risk and benefits across a more holistic understanding of different societal sectors that are affected. My question for the, for the speaker is, at the end of that process, after those voices have been heard and those perspectives have been gained, which societal entity do you suggest would be suggest. the decider? Does, do you, would he suggest would be the, 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 the decider? Yeah. Well, right. the, the, at that point, when society has said that our goal is for example, um, we need to minimize, absolutely minimize lockdowns and try to save the lives of the, of the people who are most at risk for this disease. Then at that point, you go to the public health experts and say, within that framework, what is your strategy, right? So the massive school lockdowns on the premise that kids were going to communi communicate the disease to their parents, you know, without considering the impact on the children and, you know, not considering for a moment in the city of Philadelphia, which I'm close to, how many kids depended on school lunches that disappeared when they closed the schools, right? That's after those, after, when that decision when those priorities, when that risk benefit is finished, and it's certainly, it's a wide open panel, the ordinary citizens who are public health experts should be participating in that. But it's not until that's finished that we say, okay, now what's your recommendation given this is strategy? All right. Um, yeah, uh, excellent. So um, a question that sort of also follows from that way of thinking, uh, this is from Bruce from Minnesota. He says, Madam Chair, how does the speaker, how would the speaker advise health officials as to how they can best communicate the scientific uncertainties regarding risks and prevention around a new disease and maintain trust with the public? Great question. You maintain trust by respecting the public enough to tell them the risks and your concerns and not present yourselves as omnipotent. Share the whole truth and let people decide. All right, uh, and we'll take a final question. Um, this one's from Luke from Mississippi. Um, it is, uh, he says, Madam Chair, the speaker suggests, and, and many people suggest consulting the community, but isn't it the case that sometimes that parts of the community are part of the problem? And how do we think about that? who's part of the problem depends on one's own perspective. And if you bring every, everyone together and they have a forum like we're having now, you're much likely to get to a consensus. And, you know, I'm a labor negotiator. 
I've negotiated hundreds of contracts. I might consider myself an expert. Nobody's ever 100% happy with the outcome of a contract. It is a compromise, right? And as the expert negotiator, I have 30 members of my community, rank and file workers behind me saying, this is what we want. You know, I don't make the decision what they want. They make the, they, they decide what they want and I help them get whatever part of it is reasonable to get. All right. That's, yeah. And with that, the speaker's thanked. Very good. Excellent questions and excellent answers. All righty. So we'll now go to a speech in the affirmative um, from Berta Camposanaceri. Go ahead and unmute. You have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I believe that public health officials should make decisions based on science and also have connections to the voice of the community. Uh, things shifted in a positive manner when the community, in my area, when the community voice was finally heard um, in our county. We were able to support some of the ways in which county public health staff could go into the communities that didn't trust the government um, by brainstorming places where the community was present by collaborating in those campaigns, putting pictures of people in the community who support the public health measures, people who were trusted and well-known in the community by making connections um, and getting um, businesses also to do outreach and help in talking to the community about what was needed in order for our area to lower infections. And what I think was important also is that those businesses, the community also played a role in connecting people to financial aid, to food and temporary housing for those who were needed to isolate and were living in an apartment with multiple families and it was impossible for them to isolate. So I think that sometimes everyday people or politicians making decisions on their own makes me uncomfortable. And having public health people on their own making decisions also makes me uncomfortable. Because ideally is like many already had mentioned is that we need to work together on this. We need to wait what's for the best of the community. But ultimately, when we are in an emergency, emergency situation, in a pandemic, when we lost so many lives, despite all the measurements that we tried to put in place, when all of these, when it's an actual emergency, we need to make sure that decisions are made by all of us together. But informed by that, but ultimately I believe that science, it's the one that needs to determine thinking all these other things. Um, I think that sometimes public health has experienced some of these situations in the past where we have looked at smoking regulations, when we had looked at seatbelt regulations, where, where sometimes inhibiting personal rights of people are for the benefit of the community at large. And one interesting thing that I learned given my background is that for, you know, in, in, in Latin America and other countries, we place the benefit of the community up ahead of our own interest or our own rights. And sometimes I think that has happened because we have experienced pandemics and epidemics in a way that the US hasn't for many, many years. And so we're more willing to manage some of those things to, to sort of reduce our own rights in order to benefit the population at large. And that's something fairly new for us here, I think, because we are very fortunate in this country to have good medicine 
medicine that can prevent a lot of stuff. Um, not everything, of course, but but that's some, that's a, an important point, a cultural point that sometimes people made assumptions. You know, when people talk about immigrants and low income population, they're not gonna wanna get vaccinated. Well, it turns out that once we spoke in their own language, once we explained how this, the, the, the public health prevention measures that would work, once we finally got together with public health department and came in agreement that we, both of us needed to work together, and I mean us by nonprofits and community um, with government, that we needed to get past our differences in order to push this and make changes that really shifted in our area. It worked pretty good. We made a lot of mistakes. We got into a lot of heated discussions, but in at the end, we're super proud of what we what we accomplish, you know. And yes, it wasn't perfect. <laughs> And we, we, but we have something to learn from for the future. We are better prepared. Again, it's not going to be easy, but I think it's super important that, you know, it, like in Marin, we were very fortunate that I could play that dual role because I am a citizen of the community that was being mostly affected by infections and by the public health policies too as well as I'm a public health educator working for a local nonprofit. So I work with volunteer promotores or health promoters, and they have already the trust of the community. And when, yeah, the, health department, mm -hmm. and when the health department wasn't able to connect with community, we had to work together. And when we came in, we accomplished so much more together. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what's important is to take that into consideration that nor one nor other it's everybody together thank excellent. you excellent all right jazz hands for our wonderful well, basically Bertha we just need to clone you I think that's the answer to to our problem here um so we'll start uh so for questions we'll start with uh with Wilk go ahead and unmute ask your question to me thank you madam chair uh the, the former speaker the previous speaker mentioned surrendering portions of our liberty for the good of the community. And I would ask the question, if that is the goal, if that's what we should all be doing, I, I love the idea of working together, you know, the nonprofit community, the nonprofit community has always done better with individuals than the government. So I, I applaud the nonprofit community, they're, they're awesome. But the idea of surrendering certain liberties to benefit the community, to me, strikes a chord because we know certain things like the speed limit, for example, as she mentions, or the, the, the former speaker mentioned uh, smoking and seat belts. But we know, we, we know definitively, we can look at the data and we can say that if we cut the speed limit on all interstates, from 70 miles an hour to 35 miles an hour, we would reduce the traffic deaths in the United States considerably, both, both the individual that's driving the vehicle and others that, that may be traveling on those same highways. We know that that's a fact, but yet we don't do it because at some point there's a point of diminishing returns in everything that the government tries to do. So where do you draw the line on where certain things mm -hmm. or where, where does the, the former speaker draw the line on certain activities that the government would impose upon the individual, and how how do how do we determine that? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Yeah, um, great points. And one of the the where do I where would I recommend we draw the line? For me, is when we have enough data to tell us the amount of deaths that we have we were having. The death of, of, of COVID infections were large enough. I mean, we're talking millions of people. And so when it comes to that, that is an emergency. That's an, a public health emergency. So it's different than in the others. And I agree that sometimes we come up with a law and we base things on science as we know today. And as we learn more things, then we have to shift things. Now, nowadays we were able to take masks off 
and realized that in certain circumstances, you know, we kept learning and learning and shifting that. And so for me, it's when we have enough data that says this is a pandemic and we're going to lose millions of lives with, like we did and we still are having miss, losing those lives. That's when I think the, the shift comes, not before. All right. Um, so that's a perfect tee up for our next question, which is from uh, from David K from Ithaca, New York. He says, Madam Chair, time is a scarce commodity in an emergency. Democracy and deliberation take time, almost by definition. What kind of health emergencies deserve quick decisions, even if they're controversial? We had to do that in this one. But we were still able to do some of that. We, you know, they didn't just come up. Well, actually, that's not true. At first, there was the regulations that came, right? And some of us in the community said, wait a moment. This is great, except what about those people who don't get paid leave and can't, you know, get money to pay for food or order, like some of us could order delivery of food. We don't, you know, could pay the fees. You know, if you don't get paid for being sick, then you don't do that. Um, and so I think that in this pandemic, this was a clear example of when we needed to rush things, but not ignore. And we have those clear examples of when everybody talked together and sort of negotiated things, we were successful, more successful, and, 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 and we're able to prevent a lot more deaths. All right, very good. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Excellent questions, very good answers. And a person we need to clone, maybe all of you, but at least Berta. Um, so we're now gonna move on to a speech in the negative from Ari Schulman. Go ahead, Mr. Schulman, you have five minutes. Great, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And um, I, I wanna start off by saying that um, I think it's important when people are having these debates that they think about their particular role and responsibilities that they have in those debates. Um, I get to join this debate from a somewhat luxurious position, which is that I am a journalist and uh, I'm a commentator and I did not have to make any big weighty decisions during this pandemic. I have an enormous amount of respect for the people who did have to make those decisions. They were acting under um, unimaginably difficult conditions and they were, they were choosing between a lot of hard options. Um, and I don't envy the people who had to make those decisions and we, we owe them a debt of gratitude for a lot of the decisions they did made, include, uh, including the rapid development of vaccines, which is one of the great success stories of the pandemic. So um, we've been asked to, to talk about stories that we can bring in here. And there's a couple that I wanna draw on. Um, one is like, like a lot of people, I've been thinking about this question of why was there not more vaccine uptake? And I went back and did some reading about the polio campaign in the 1950s and why that one was so much more successful. And there were a couple of things that I learned from that. One was that that campaign, first of all, it had a long time um, to build up public support for it. It was the product of the March of Dimes. There was a, actually a big public campaign to get the public to contribute to and fund this campaign. So it was something that the public actually owned as something it was doing on its own. Um, there, and there was a, a real effort to do that, to get the public involved with it in that way. Uh, there was also, there were a lot of mistakes that were made during the polio um, vaccine rollout. There was something called the Cutter Incident where uh, they accidentally put live polio vaccine into the vax, uh, live polio virus into the vaccines and a bunch of children wound up getting infected. I don't mention that as a negative example against vaccines. I mention it actually as a positive example because the, the public health community responded to this in a really admirable way. They acknowledged what had happened. They uh, fully aired the story of what had gone wrong. They took responsibility for it. They showed what they were doing to fix it. And they demonstrated to people that they could trust the campaign. And the outcome was that this is actually often talked about as an example of uh, public health leaders gaining trust of the people as a result of the way that they managed some of their mistakes. Um, as a contrast to this, um, there are a number of stories from, from COVID that have been distressingly lacking in this spirit. Um, one that has really troubled me, there was a, a story in Vanity Fair uh, back in December about a group of experts who brought to the White House, to the Biden administration last fall, a plan to do mass rapid testing. 
Um, this was a plan that potentially could have changed the way that the pandemic was happening. It would have given a vital tool to people. It was eventually done in a very small scale way, but the, the White House rejected this plan um, largely on the guidance of experts who, who told them two things. One of them was that if there were, was a rapid testing plan, it might remove people's motivation to get vaccinated. Um, and the other was that a lot of the, the health establishment was resistant to a rapid testing plan. I'll quote from the article here. Testing on their view should be used only by doctors as a diagnostic instrument, not by individuals as a public health tool for influencing decisions. There are a lot of decisions that were made during COVID that display the same kind of pattern. Uh, there's even one today, there's a story out about how the FDA may delay approval of one of the vaccines for children under the age of five, because they think it will be simpler for people to understand if they wait until the summer when they're trying to approve two, vac two vaccines. It's just a, it's really hard for me to wrap my mind around the logic of that decision. And I think that it is a product of this frayed trust and it is a product of the view that you have a kind of recalcitrant, recalcitrant public um, that needs to be sort of psychologically managed and that, that shouldn't be participating um, in the decision process. Um, so we have the situation of badly frayed trust and what do we do about it? Um, it requires acts from people, um, acts of kind of unearned generosity and grace to act as if they have a trust for the other side of this equation that maybe hasn't been earned. Uh, this is something I tell the people who mistrust the public health establishment that they still need to think about their communal role, even if they, uh, they don't trust the people who are telling them to think that way. But it's much, much more important, I think. This isn't a both sides issue. It's much more important um, that the public health side of this equation understand their distinctive responsibility. They are acting in a leadership role and they are asking to be trusted and they've gotten into this kind of situation of, um, of basically acting like the public uh, owes them deference. Um, the basic question that we have to answer here in thinking about this is, does the public health system exist to serve the public or does the public exist to serve the public health system? Uh, I think in the abstract, probably everyone would say the public health system exists to serve the people. But the kind of behavior patterns that we've seen throughout COVID and, and in past pandemics as well, including during AIDS, it's like it's the other way around, uh, as if this is something that is simply earned uh, or something that is simply owed to the, to the establishment. And I think as long as that attitude is around, we're going to continue to have this problem. And the onus to change this is really on public health leaderships. Uh, leadership. They're the ones who, who really need to uh, act first. All right, jazz hands for the speaker. Very good. All right, uh, we're going to move to questions. And I have a question. Um, so, sure. which I get to do, and because I'm the center of the world this evening, I, I get to use the word you also. So, um, so Ari, I'm curious. Um, I loved the the many of the things that you have just said, it's it's a really sophisticated analysis. Um, I am curious what you think led to the level of um, distrust. So uh, you said that uh, public health experts speak as though um, they they sort of know all the things and the public just ought to offer them deference. What do you think led to this? Um, are there any parts of it, basically, is there any justification to public health experts not totally trusting the public? And if so, what would it be? Sure, there's plenty of justification, um, but there isn't a uh, there isn't exactly an excuse for it. It's something that I try to, to caution when I'm talking to um, to people who are even further gone than I am and their mistrust of the public health establishment is to say this this kind of um, belief that that the expert class knows better. That's just something that kind of comes naturally with that role. These are people who are appointed to understand things better than us. I sometimes use the, use the analogy of taking your car to the mechanic, right? You go into the mechanic, you're gonna have a kind of negotiation um, about what work your car needs. Are we gonna replace the transmission? Or are we just gonna do this one little overhaul? And part of the reason you're going to the mechanic is this person genuinely knows the subject matter better than you do but you own your car and you know your own value trade-offs better than you do. And there isn't a clear sort of hierarchy about who, who should decide one thing or the other. I don't think a, a sort of 
the expert knows the facts and I know the values thing is a, is a great way to think about this. You each have a sort of perspective that has to be negotiated. Um, and there is something, there's something dangerous about that, that, um, that interchange that you have with the expert. And your goal is to try to set limits on that danger and also extract value from it in the way that people who are, are very sophisticated and very good at achieving a particular job um, can be useful. You want to be able to use them in that way while setting limits on the, the links that they would go to that you don't want them to. That's a very, very small analogy, but some sort of similar dynamic I think applies uh, in the broader public health realm. Great, thank you. And then we'll take one more question. Uh, this is from Aaron Sams from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He says, Madam Chair, what does the speaker believe is culturally different now from during the time of the polio and flu outbreaks? Why did society believe polio and flu were dangerous and worthy of mass concern? And why is COVID different? Gosh, that's a big question. Uh, I, I wish I had an elegant- <laughs> yeah, One minute, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I wish I had an elegant short answer to that. Um, Part, I mean, part of it has to be that, that uh, polio was particularly a threat to children. And I think the psychology around that was, was different. And that's something that we've all done a poor job in talking about. It's been the other way around during COVID. Children have been at the lowest risk um, and have borne a disproportionate share of the burdens. Um, that's, that's the briefest explanation I can offer. I think the rest has to do with uh, just overall extremely different relationships uh, between the public and institutions in general and the level of trust that happened then. But I, I will say that there were there were skeptics even at the time and there was what would now be called disinformation. Those are not things that are novel now, those have been with us uh, for all of American life. You can go back to the Revolutionary War and you can find the same sorts of fights over vaccine mandates. That that fundamental dynamic is just part of the way that pandemics happen. It's not some, some totally novel fracture of the moment that we're living in. All right, and with that, the speaker is thanked. Very good, so interesting. I am learning so much. Um, all right, uh, we will now go to, so just a, a short interruption. Um, I'm gonna take slightly fewer questions and ask uh, the answers to be kept to one minute, just because we're, um, I'm, I'm being mindful of time. Um, that said, uh, speeches, you still get the full five minutes. And so we will now go for an affirmative speech to Dr. Willis. Go ahead and unmute, you have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, thank you for inviting me to join this, this conversation. I think this is one of the most important conversations that could be happening right now nationally. I see the next, um, the next chapter of our pandemic response really needs to be um, healing divisions. And there isn't nearly enough of this kind of dialogue that's happening. So I've, I've gained a lot from, from this conversation so far. I also wanna say that um, sharing this panel with uh, Francis Collins, I almost said Sir Francis Collins. <laughs> feels, feels a bit like being a high school music teacher on stage with, with Jimi Hendrix, but um, I'll do my best. So I'm someone who has set pandemic policies as a county public health officer. And this has been one of the most challenging roles or has been without a doubt the most challenging role of my professional life. Um, sitting in my position now, I know just how complex and nuanced these questions are. So. My answer to the resolution is not an unequivocal yes, but a yes, however. Um, and there's a lot, really the answer is in that, however. If our goal is to reach some level of understanding together or to rebuild trust, it will lie in the nuances, the good questions around hard choices and the gray areas more than in the same simple proclamations from both sides. So with that in mind, I'd like to share my approach to public health policies as a, as a, as a policymaker. And I think it jives with what's, what's been said. The first thing is to be clear in our goal. Um, and that goal is the health and well being for all residents. In Marin, we like to look to the World Health Organization definition of health. In 1948, so just coming out of World War II, they defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease. We really got a lot of mileage out of that framing in our local pandemic response. In setting public health policies, it's critical for us to see that wider frame that includes social, mental, and physical health, because this allows us to balance harms and benefits of policies across disciplines and sectors. 
But to make policy this way requires a new kind of dialogue. And that's what I think we we're seeing emerging out of this conversation with shared leadership with the people affected by the policy as, as Berta Campos addressed so eloquently. Um, I'll end with um, what would you have done if you were me scenario. <laughs> so in spring 2020, um, schools across America closed. As summer ended, we had a decision of whether to reopen schools. In California, local health officers could apply for a waiver out of the state school closure mandate. So the rule was that schools were closed, but local health officers could actually apply for a waiver from that. So I had a decision of whether or not we wanted to apply for that waiver. Most counties were not going that direction. Remember, this was pre-vaccine, pre-treatment, cases were surging and hospitals were filling. The data were limited, and it was possible that schools would fuel community spread, in-person learning. There was obviously strong opinions on both sides, and a lot was at stake. And that's the kind of dilemma that public health leaders inherited. So I just invite you to imagine how you would navigate that moment. In Marin, we chose to reopen schools, and we're the first in the state to do so. And here's why. As soon as schools closed, we started engaging in dialogue about how to open them with parents, teachers, the Office of Education, pediatricians, and community members to ensure we could do it safely and that we all understood the risks and benefits, known and unknown to the degree that we could see them, informed by public health expertise. Informed by public health expertise and how the virus is best controlled. When the vaccine arrived in December, we prioritized teachers to be near the front of the line. And later we did school-wide vaccination events. Our rates of vaccination across the board in Marin County are among the highest in the nation and, among, and are among our school children. Um, so I think this is an example to me of how public health decisions, whether or not to open schools and which schools, this was based on community dialogue and clear public health protocols for keeping schools safe and good data monitoring to measure outcomes. I think that the future, we need to focus on the elements of how trust is built and not this binary sort of yes or no, but how does scientific expertise get brought into decision-making with community? And for that, I think we need to engage in a lot more conversations like this. Thank you. All right, jazz hands for our speaker. Thank you. So questions. Um, we will start with this one from Stephen Lundstein from Knoxville, Tennessee. He says, Madam Chair, given the amount of different information available on the internet, how can people who may not have the time to go through the scientific literature ensure that they are getting the proper information so that they can properly help inform decision making? Go ahead. Yeah, I think this gets to the heart of the question of trust. I mean, I think that's, um, that's what stimulated this conversation in the first place. Um, and I think we are in an unprecedented, you know, Going back to the previous question about what's different now versus polio, I think the, the internet and, and just the amazing array and kaleidoscopic set of inputs that all of us are being subject to is a unique and modern challenge. Um, and I would, I think now more than ever, we need to lean into well-established and trustworthy methods for understanding truth um, and, and navigating, navigating science. Um, there are historically, there are ways of understanding truth. Um, there are ways of describing um, the natural world that we can lean into. Um, the CDC is, um, you know, has, I think, a history of, of strong public health practice that has been undermined in the past, you know, in the past two years. But the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Collins, you know, these are, they are institutions that I myself lean into and trust. I understand the methods of placebo control, randomized studies. These are really methods to try and reduce bias um, that might be introduced in, in understanding the, the efficacy of the vaccines, for example, or the efficacy of different medications. Um, so I might, my answer would be to, to identify those in your life who you trust. Uh, our physicians are, are important partners for us. I think by and large, our medical, our healthcare providers mm -hmm our trusted messengers. Last line. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, sorry. And then also uh, community members like uh, like Don, like I almost said Dr. Campos. <laughs> but Dr. <laughs> Campos, yeah, yeah, who can who can speak forward in, in a way that's culturally appropriate for for everyone. Wonderful. 
All right, so I am gonna um, <laughs> be tyrannical and ask you and, and take one more question uh, this evening for you. Um, and again, I get to use the word you, um, so that's why I'm doing that. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, Dr. Willis, um, you speak very persuasively and I'm curious what you think of Ari's uh, idea about how when you're in a position of expertise, it's easy to, I don't know, for there to be a dynamic that develops where it seems like you do know more than other people. And what do you think about that? And how, if you agree that that is a temptation, how can public health leaders um, guard against it? Yeah, I mean, it's a great, it is a great point that Ari, um, that the previous speaker um, brought up. And I think that is a, it is a lesson learned. I mean, I think this is part of, if we are going to heal divides, it's going to be motion on both sides. If you're, if you're trying to find something, and I think on, on our side, if I'm speaking on behalf of the sort of medical establishment or public health, um, there is, I think, a, um, a problem of um, a lack of humility sometimes that comes into the conversation. And I, I learned this as a physician. You know, I, when I was a physician, you go through medical school, you learn so much science, and it's so intoxicating because it's so, um, it's so tight, and, there's the, and, it, and it, it makes so much sense, and it's, it's describing nature. And, and you come out of there ready to apply that in your patient's lives and they may have diabetes and you say, here's a medicine and here's how it works and you should take that medicine. And then it turns out the patient just doesn't take it and their, their, their sugars go up and you get perplexed as to why is it, you know, I have all the science for you. Why are you not taking advantage of this tool? And you recognize that it's not about that. It's about listening more than talking. Um, the education, is actually more importantly, the other direction. Rather than when we talk about education in public health, when we talk about education in clinical settings, I think we need to flip the arrow. And what we're trying to do is actually educate ourselves um, so that we're hearing, and then we're able to actually offer the, the right messaging that actually lands where that person lives at that moment. Um, and that's where I think we need to we need to grow and change as a as a, as a medical establishment as public health. All right. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Jazz hands. Very good. All right. Um, or thumbs up. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so for last but not least, uh, the last in our initial round of speeches, then we'll have some responses after this. I'd like to call on for a speech in the negative. Um, uh, Lincoln Earl Centers, and I'm just going to name, by the way, that uh, we had a speaker pull out at the last minute due to a, a health emergency, unfortunately. I think she's going to be okay. But um, so Lincoln uh, has stepped in with like two hours notice. And so we're just going to give him some jazz hands for that. Um, and, <laughs> all right, uh, Mr. Earl Centers, go for it. Thank Five you. Minutes. Um, I hope that my sound is okay. I, I didn't switch devices, so my sound will get better if it's not okay yet. And yeah, thank you for acknowledging that this is on short notice that I'm joining you and I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you and thank all my fellow participants for their perspectives that they bring and the tone that everybody's brought tonight and for our organization, Braver Angels, for holding this kind of a debate. Um, I'm glad to be able to participate. So I've been, uh, again, just had a brief amount of time to sort of pull thoughts together and have been listening to all of you speak your, your perspectives. And so I'm speak just gonna there. sort of pull, mm -hmm. pull a few threads together here. And um, I'm, I'm participating tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm involved in Braver Angels and I'm actually a state coordinator here in Vermont in the Northeast. And so I'm, I care deeply about this mission of engaging one another across differences where we value our diversity of perspectives as being a key to moving forward collectively. Um, the question before us, this question, public health decisions should be made by experts, not ordinary decisions. And the following question, uh, the follow up of can we find a way to rebuild trust between citizens and public health leaders? The question itself um, concerns me a little bit, the way that the framing is that, that what's implicit in the question, to me, how it stands out is that it's an either or question, that either experts and institutions um, are given the role of an authoritarian role 
uh, whether it's public health or, or other topics or no role at all. And I find that this framing itself um, can it sort of lends itself to sort of the divisive nature of this divide. And, and I'm, I'm very concerned. I know other speakers have mentioned what, a, what an important topic this is to take on both, both COVID-19 as a topic and the, and the public health response to that. And then the public's response to the public health response, but also the topic of division and polarization and, and the lack of public trust in public institutions and in experts uh, are very, very tied together and, and feel like they're really peaking together, linked together. Um, so much of that has to do with, with our new media space and, and living so much of our lives in digital space. And we're all wrestling with these issues of becoming siloed in our perspectives and um, having antagonistic um, characterizations of each other sort of rewarded and promoted. And um, so, so there's, we're, we're in a mess. And, and so I think this is so important as an active step towards trying to get out of that, that set of cycles. Um, our first speaker mentioned in a response to uh, one of the questions that they received, they, they used the phrase, we depend on experts for advice. Um, and I completely agree with this statement and it's why I'm troubled with the, the resolved question that we're faced with. Because for me, the difference is whether we look to public health officials for advice or for decisions. And an, another speaker mentioned about going to a mechanic or anytime we have a relationship with an expert, I'm an arborist. If I go to talk to a, um, you know, a doctor or a professor or any sort of professional, our relationship with profess, professionals is to go and seek advice and recommendation and get filled in so that we have good content of information to make our choices. Nobody goes to a doctor and has the doctor make a decision unless they're unconscious, literally unconscious, and there's nobody else to make that decision. A doctor would never make the decision for us. And so to extrapolate, you know, onto the macro and the institutional level that we are, you know, that we're framing this as a conversation of whether, whether or not experts should have the role of making decisions for us as the public is what troubles me. And I know that it's a, it's a really common thread across the the real varied and diverse spectrum of people who resist or feel opposed to public policy around COVID that um, so often there's a lot of um, belittling of the community, the, the diverse community of people who are concerned with the repercussions and consequences of public health policy along with the risks and, and consequences of COVID-19 and that so often um, things are, there's my five minute timer for myself, so I'll wrap up. <laughs> so often things are oversimplified and conflated where people are mischaracterized as, as groups and, um, you know, labels are thrown around and, and people aren't taken in good faith for being informed and, and caring. And so I think this kind of conversation goes a long way towards Building, building a tone of communication so that people can talk about differences of perspective um, without starting out antagonistically. So I appreciate that and look forward to right. hearing more from people. Jazz hands for our speaker. Yes, definitely. And we will move to questions. I think since we're running a tiny bit behind, I might just take one this time. Um, let's see. All right, here's one. Um, and this is from Luke from Virginia. He asks, Madam Chair, does the speaker think better dialogue and discussion and better process of decision-making would eliminate the fundamental tension and fundamental antagonism between technocratic public health officials and the liberty of citizens? I can repeat that if you like. Um, I, I think I get the gist of it and I appreciate it. Um, so what it brings up for me, that question is that you know, again, I, what I've observed is that this trend towards less and less trust in, in institutions and experts has just really been peaking. It's on a, it's on a curve upwards, politically, institutionally, every, everywhere you look, and, and especially around COVID. 
and I think other speakers have spoken eloquently about the tone and sort of the tone deafness of experts being condescending or lacking humility or curiosity or sensitivity when they communicate information, especially when it's you know represented in like we're making decisions for people rather than offering the best information for people to be informed and make their own decisions. So I think I think that's a that's a big piece of it is that um, yeah, just paying attention to the to the tone of how we engage across divisions. Um, and maybe I'm missing another another piece of that question, but that that's what comes to mind for me. All right, very good. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Yes, jazz hands for our Thank fabulous you. pinch hitter. Yes. Alrighty, so in a moment, we're going to shift to response speeches. And these are not rebuttals necessarily, they're just an opportunity for each panelist to respond to what's been said. Um, but before we do that, uh, we're gonna do a quick poll of the, uh, the attendees, everybody watching, to ask, what would you like to hear more about? Um, so Gretchen, if you go ahead and launch that, everyone will have one minute to fill it out. All right, 30 seconds more. Five more seconds. All right, done. So, uh, yep, we'll go ahead and share these results. Good. Um, so folks are interested in, in basically every aspect of this, but there are two that actually stand out, um, which are, uh, so this is panelists mostly for you to think about as you go into the response speeches section, which are the questions around balancing individual versus community needs and rights. And then also the effects of misinformation and disinformation and how to evaluate it. Um, so all of it's interesting, we're interested in everything you're going to say, um, but it sounds like for the folks here, those two themes in particular are, are where their minds are, or where our minds are. So thank you for that. Um, and panelists, you'll have to actually click the X to make the poll go away. So we are now going to go to our response speeches. We will still go affirmative, negative, affirmative, negative, but it'll be, it is in reverse order. So uh, for the first one, I would like to go to return to Dr. Willis. Two minutes to respond. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take my two minutes. I think not to, not to offer a, a rebuttal so much as a amplification or an affirmation. Um, this, uh, you know, it's, it's clear to me, I'm, I'm more concerned about the people that aren't part of this conversation than the people who are in some ways, you know, I think, I'm feeling very encouraged, but I'm I'm discouraged that I you know, the epidemiologist in me realizes that this is a highly biased sample. <laughs> we are because we are here together. You know, we have chosen to come to this conversation, and that in itself reflects an interest in building bridges. And I think that's the we need to amplify that and grow that spirit. And I, I think what's what I've heard in this conversation does potentially have legs to get into those more intractable sectors where the conversation frankly is is more um more divided you know i personally you know we i think we've all sort of had the, the the personalization of this because we have strongly held beliefs and because we're part of this conversation i think we probably all had personal experiences of of um people not being respectful and, and um it's been really refreshing for me to have what feels like a really good conversation without a lot of uh, vitriol. So um, I wanna thank everyone for that and feel hopeful that this is the kind of thing that we're going to be able to do more of. Just by way of pushing us further, I think um, what I'm hearing on, on our side is you know, widening the frame. I think that resonated a lot for me you know, and, and with others was that we need to widen the frame of our understanding of what public health means and understanding is more holistic well-being, including social, economic, mental well-being, and not just preventing transmission. 
widening that frame, but I would encourage others to think also about widening the frame around freedom and personal liberties. And that's why I think you know, we could expand the conversation because to some, what, what might be read as freedom might actually marginalize the freedoms of others. Um, and that's when I have policies, it's really my idea is to maximize the freedom of everyone, including people who are historically marginalized. Um, and that's where I think the conversation could mature, both in how we widen the frame in both of those spheres. Thank you. All right, very good. And with that, Dr. Willis is thanked. Jazz hands, yeah, all righty. And then for our, our second uh, response speech in the negative, we will go to Mr. Earl Centers. Thank you. you two minutes. Mm -hmm. Let's see, quick turnaround to come up with new thoughts. So, so um, what I wanted to what I wanted to touch on, uh, thinking about the individual versus, versus collective and the myths and disinformation topics sort of bubbling up to the top. Um, one of the things that I have found in my experience of this last couple of years is how stuck in the mud we all get with information and that so much of how we behave has to do with beliefs and values and that the information part informs that and it's an important part, uh, but we do a lot of trying to convince each other with, it, with information. Um, and, and I think we've all had the experience of how flat that lands, that it's just not, it's not effective, it's not working, it doesn't work to convince each other with information. Um, and, and, I, and I just see this, um, this issue over and over again of oversimplification of complex and nuanced issues where we stereotype and, and mischaracterize one another and one another's perspectives in ways that just further drive the division and the derision of tone that, that people engage with. I, I have found myself in a really broad and diverse and worldwide um, network of people who are really concerned about the direction that society is taking. And a lot of that has to do with concern about the direction that public health has decided to go in in response to the risks um, around COVID-19. And, and I know from being in that community that it's a diverse and caring and informed community. It's not, and, and I also know on the other side that people are acting in good faith and with the best information and the best intentions they can. Um, and so in that way, you know, so much of the divide I think is, is overhyped and, and oversimplified in that way that if we, can, uh, if we can do more of coming to the table and talking about the differences, because a lot of it is narrative differences. A lot of it is, is real core differences about how we view the future moving forward and what story we want to live into with our own health and with our collective health. And so it's, it's just, it's a complicated world. And, and we, uh, I think we, we tend to oversimplify things too often to our detriment. Right. Mm -hmm. And with that, the speaker is thanked. One more round of jazz hands. Yes, very good. And for our next response speech, uh, Ms. Berta Campos on the two minutes. Yes, I think it's important that we work together, as I mentioned, so for the benefit of the entire population. And I also, what made me think after hearing all the speakers is also that, you know, science is not perfect in that, yes, we need to be more transparent in how we talk about what we know and what we don't know. Um, but also, um, as I heard others talk, it seems to me that things were done differently in different places, that there wasn't uh, a, a lot of uniformity and how policies were implemented. Um, because, you know, in our area, there were talks with chambers of commerce, they were, they were talks with business owners, be, with policy, Dr. Willis would meet with some of us, you know, and, and, and to explain and to do all this transparency stuff, but I don't think that happens in other areas, what I'm hearing. So that's the other piece that I think we didn't get to talk about here tonight is the fact that how do we find a way so that things are more consistent and look at those models that work the best because they were not perfect, but at least to learn from that so that we could have a better response nationwide for everyone and not just for some sectors. All right, very good. With that, the speaker is thanked. Jazz hands. Mm -hmm. 
And for our next response speech, we will go to Ari, Ari Shulman. Thanks. Um, so I'm gonna move on from the mechanic thing and see if I can offer another analogy. I just thought of this during this call. I'm still thinking through whether it makes sense, but let's try it out. Think about the military and the relationship that we have this in this country to the military, right? We have a very firm principle of law that we have civilian control over the military. We have that very deeply ingrained in our culture as well. Imagine if we kept that in the law, but we started to lose that as a matter of culture. And we started to develop this idea that we love our generals so much and we trust them so much and they're so good at their jobs that maybe we should just let them decide when we're gonna to go to war. Maybe we should let them decide when we're going to end a war. And elected leaders say, you know, we don't really think it's our place to decide something like this. We're gonna just leave that to the generals. What do you think would happen? I think that we would get, first of all, a lot of paranoia and mistrust of the military that would come out of this. Um, you could see the whole sort of, you can see what I'm getting at here, right? You can see the whole sort of sequence playing out. There probably would be a lot of genuinely false misinformation that was circulating in, about what the military was doing. You'd probably also get a lot of bad actors who had other reasons for wanting to oppose the military and what they're doing, who take advantage of this cynically. Um, all of those things would happen. All of those things happen anyway, even when we do have good civilian control over the military, but they would be much, much worse under this sorts of scenario, uh, under the scenario of, you don't even have to imagine this very much. There, there are past periods in American history where something like this has kind of played out. You had some of these dynamics during Vietnam and the Cold War. Um, the point I wanna make here is we need an aggressive and powerful military to fight wars, just like we need an aggressive and public health establishment, uh, public health establishment to, to fight pandemics. But we have to have a clear, clear culture of understanding that this is an establishment that works for us, that there is full and final civilian control over this institution. You notice that we have this at the military and the military is actually one of the most trusted institutions in the country. And I think it is because that relationship is so, is so well understood. So I think no amount of better communications and no amount of changing the messaging ecosystem is going to do much of anything until we can fully assert and drop this idea that because public health is drawing on science that it's somehow exempt from this, we have to have a very clear and firm sense um, of civilian control here and of public control and of the political process deciding the goals that we want public health to then go and execute for us and maintaining that kind of accountability. Then maybe we can shore up that trust. All righty. With that, the speakers, thanks. Yes, and yes. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have Dr. Stanford. Go ahead, you have two minutes. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1776, Thomas Jefferson penned these words in the Declaration of Independence during the height of slavery here in this country. As a Black woman physician scientist, as I hear us talk about liberties, freedoms, justice, I recognize that that does not apply equally to me, the descendant of slaves here in this country. And when we talk about this, we have to recognize that we can't just think from our vantage point. But when you come from a point of majority and privilege, you have less likelihood of recognizing your own privilege. When we talk about using public health and using science and reflecting upon those two, they need to be intertwined. But for so many years, persons like myself were not allowed to end up with the five degrees that I have. But even in the midst of that, being still judged differently than other individuals and assuming that our ability to influence the public health, both from the general community and from the scientific community must not have as much worth and value. And it was by this vein that I wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine, Beyond Tuskegee, Vaccine Distrust in the Black Community. We have to think about this idea of public health and public health experts, but reflecting these communities that are marginalized as was previously discussed. It is only then can we really talk about individual versus community when we think not only of ourselves, but those groups that are disenfranchised, those groups that have been overlooked, those groups that are descendants of enslaved. Thank you. All right, with that, the speaker is thanked. Jazz hands, yep, very powerful. Next, we have Dr. Jerry Silverman. Go ahead, Jerry, you have two minutes. We need you to unmute. 
Zoom is the worst, I know. Okay, you know. Th there were some there were some clear commonalities, I think, among all the speakers, which is that um, the question was flawed. And, and almost all of us addressed that one way or the other, because by its own establishment of a polarity, and no one in the room said that experts don't have a role. The question is, how do you define that role? That's the $64 question. And I really love the examples from Dr. the example from Dr. Willis. I think if it had been done that way, it would have been much less divisive in the country. Um, and the actual behavior would have been very different. Uh, I think we're all being a little bit naive about the role of money and corporate power in this issue. It's not just ordinary citizens and experts, because there are, um, you know, the huge hospital chains, which refuse to provide protective equipment early on. And while they, they were, while the public authorities um, were busy locking us down and mandating masks, hospital workers uh, were unprotected. And there was no there was no overweening pressure, overwhelming pressure on those hospital enterprises from our public health authorities to get their act together for proper isolation and proper protective equipment for months and months and months into the epidemic. They put signs out in front that said everybody's a hero, but inside they were being treated horrendously. And then threatened with being fired if they as health professionals came to the conclusion that they did not want a vaccine. So, you know, we have to, and, and then you have, I hear on the radio every day, ads paid for by Pfizer and Moderna asking people to get vaccinated. So we, we need, I mean, this is a third party that's out there in this discussion that we haven't really talked about. If we could have that, you know, uh, unimpeded discussion between citizens and experts, I think we would get a lot farther along. I just wanted to add that to the conversation, but I do think, uh, and I do think the very important point that, that Dr. Stanford raised about not categorizing people, we heard both public health up. officials but yes. and, mm -hmm. and elected officials referring to the unvaccinated, a pejorative term for a group of people. All right, but that the speaker thanked. Jazz hands, yeah. And uh, for our uh, second to last response speech, we have Dr. Collins. Go ahead, two minutes. Well, I've learned a lot in this conversation and done a lot of listening. And I wanna thank all of you for expanding my understanding of some of the basis of these conflicts that we've all been living with and um, learned many of those lessons from previous conversations with Wilk and today has further enhanced that. I do think a lot of what we have been wrestling with when it comes to public health is this balance as was brought out in the questionnaire uh, between individual rights and community needs. And this also comes down to this question of what is freedom? Uh, is it all about rights or is it also about responsibility? And what a public health system has to do is to try to figure out how to balance that oftentimes in the face of very uncertain uh, parameters where the data is incomplete. You almost have to figure out what's the value of a human life. If you thought that by imposing something that is gonna cause a lot of people unhappiness, uh, you could save a few hundred lives, wouldn't you feel like you had to do it anyway? But of course you should ask the community whether they agree with you on that and not just decide that you know. Uh, that's where the tension comes in. And I, I don't know if that's completely been captured in a lot of the debates about the way in which public health decisions have been made. Even lockdowns, remember Donald Trump supported a lockdown because it was thought to be in, in spring of 2020, the only way that we were gonna save potentially tens of thousands of lives. Turned out not to be very effective. We know that now, but we didn't know that then. So this is why it's such a tough dilemma. Second point, I guess, that I want to make in my two minutes is that what we're looking at tonight is basically an example, a reflection of a larger societal malaise that we're in the middle of. We had, had this debate about why is this different than polio. I think the society was a lot different in the 1950s. 
everything now is seen through a lens of polarization, of tribalism, of weaponization of information and colored over by this horrendous deluge of misinformation and disinformation coming at you from every possible direction, not just social media, but also sometimes politicians. And that's made it so much harder for us to deal with the situation that we now have. So that sounds pretty grim. Braver Angels puts itself in the position of trying to stand in the midst of that and find some ways for people to talk to each other. And I'm grateful that we got a chance to do that tonight. All right, thank you. We've got the speakers, thanks. Yes, jazz hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, for our final response speech, Mr. Wilk, two minutes. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to all the speakers tonight. This has been incredible. Um, I hear, I hear very reasonable and very logical argument from both sides uh, of this topic, and I, I think that's, I think that's an incredibly important point, and we can do that because we are in a respectful atmosphere. We are looking at each other. We are seeing each other. And we are actually airing our grievances in a respectful way. That is not what happens a lot of time in what some call the internet ecosystem or uh, you know the dumpster fire of social media that we have. And what has happened is we have lost trust. That's why we're here. We've lost trust in our public officials. We have lost trust in each other. We have lost trust. We, we, have, we have built an anger and an animosity between friends, family members, neighbors, politicians, and the citizen, the individual, and we need to rebuild that. That is one of the very important things in the project that Dr. Collins and I are involved in, rebuilding that trust. And there is ways that we can do it, but it will take work, and it's going to take work from everybody, everybody from every walk of life from me, a redneck from the Midwest, to an intellectual elite like Dr. Collins in the Washington DC Beltway. And, and it's conversations like this that are gonna rebuild that trust. But it's also gonna require the institutions that we rely on as individuals to be fully transparent. I heard that word transparency a number of times tonight. Transparency and then also this is the very important part, and this is what caused a lot of the mistrust over the past 24, 25, 26 months in this country, is the fact that our institutions in many ways, whether it be the government, whether it be the public health officials, whether it be the media, whether it be big tech and social media, did a lot to stifle the thoughts and opinions of people with whom they disagree. That right there played a bigger part in the mistrust that we see today in our institutions and the individual than anything else. By quashing the ability of people to speak what was on their mind, we now have the biggest environment of mistrust that we have ever seen in the nation of our history, or the history of our nation, excuse me. That'll yield Thanks. the rest of my time. <laughs> With that, the speaker is thanked. Yes, jazz hands. All right, um, so we, this is excellent. We are now going to um, uh, do a, a, a technically adjourn the debate and then do a, a public debrief. Um, won't take too long. I know we're a little over time, um, but just hang with me for like 10 more minutes and I'll let you go to bed or go to dinner, whatever coast you're on or whatever you're doing in the middle. Um, so uh, for the technical adjournment of the debate, I would just like one panelist to say, I move we adjourn. Jerry, you were muted, but I saw it. Um, and so I'd like somebody to say second. 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 Awesome. Okay. So with that, our debate is adjourned. Um, and now uh, we get to, so many of you have actually said some of your answers to these questions already, but I want to give um, the, the, uh, all the attendees a chance to express what they think. So we're going to enter a short period of time where we're all going to try to answer the questions uh, what did you learn tonight and what did you enjoy? And so um, if the staff would open up the chat, uh, attendees, you are welcome to put your answers to those questions into the chat. What did you learn and what did you enjoy? 
And then panelists, many of you have spoken to this. Um, so if you feel like you've said what you have, that's, that's great. Um, but if you do have something that you wanna offer uh, on what you learned tonight or what you enjoyed, go ahead and just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Ari. Um, I just wanted to echo what, can we address each other directly now? I wanted to echo yes, what, you can, yes. what Wilk said. I was thinking about this before this, about how different the format of this debate is from the format of what we've just lived through for the last two years. And there's a, there's a kind of privilege in that. And um, I wish we could, I, I think we should modulate our expectations about scaling this up to 330 million people in the whole process. But I think the fact of, like just the fact that we can get on here and talk to the former director of the National Institutes of Health and other people who are in actual decision-making modes, that didn't happen, I don't think nearly enough during the pandemic. I wish that there had been better ways for it to happen. And I'm, I'm glad that it's, that it's happened here. It seems like the kind of thing that we need more of uh, to, be able to, <laughs> to be able to fix whatever this problem is. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and I encourage panelists to, to read what's coming in on the chat. It's wonderful. One that I like is, I learned that those who I disagree with on this topic make a lot more sense than I have given them credit for. Also, I enjoyed hearing from Dr. Collins, forget celebrities, I want his autograph. <laughs> so we have that. We also have humility is the key. I enjoyed witnessing the respect uh, among the speakers. I learned there are two sides to every story. Um, so yeah, uh, lots of good stuff in here. Jerry Silverman for president. <laughs> Love this. Um, Dr. Willis is getting some shout outs. Yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, other, so other panelists, go ahead and you can raise your hand. Um, yeah, Dr. Willis, what did you learn? What did you enjoy? Yeah, um, I just, I, my, my sense coming out of this is that um, I think it is possible that things are not as divided as they seem. Um, I, as much as it is, I mean, it's sort of an interesting, once we sort of realize that things that, that, that certain things are being constructed for us through the media, it may or may not be true, but can take on a life of their own because of the way they're narrated around. It's possible that the divide itself might be amplified or exaggerated in that in the media. Um, you know, this conversation won't get any coverage. Like we're not going to get you know local newspaper coverage that we we had we had a civil dialogue. But if there was a fight, you know, that might get coverage. Um, so my point is, is that we probably need to feel encouraged that it's possible that I think what we're what we're able to manage tonight in terms of maybe not agreeing, you know, we may, we may not agree at the end of the day, but at least we can have a conversation where we have better understanding of the other perspectives might be something that is more actually more accessible to us as a nation. Um, and that it's another example of how we really probably shouldn't be paying too much attention to the garbage that comes across our, our screens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I wanna remind, so I'll come to you in just a second, Dr. Collins. I just wanna remind the, the folks in the chat, a lot of great comments in here um, and the questions we're answering are what did we learn and what did we enjoy? All right, Dr. Collins, over to you. I want to echo what, what Matt just said that I found in these conversations that what seems to divide us oftentimes are the kinds of beliefs that get anchored into our minds based upon events that have happened, um, cultural influences, the fact that our society is so fractured. But underneath all of that, we find that there's something we can all really anchor to, which is frankly our values that we all really still believe in freedom. We, and we believe in family and in faith. We believe in love and we believe in truth. Uh, things like beauty, uh, we care about those things. Goodness, that matters, justice. We could sort of list uh, what's, what's your top 10 there. And I think all of us would go, yeah, I believe that. If we could figure out how to strip away all of the other stuff that gets added on top of that, much of which gets very contentious and get back to that bedrock of foundational values. I think we'd all find that we're actually a lot alike and this evening helped, I think, bring some of that closer to the surface. Wonderful. And then, um, yeah, Lincoln, go ahead. Um, just quickly, what I wanted to add is that 
I wanted to acknowledge that coming to the table is, you know, it's it's right that we're not getting into debate about content, that there's there's something important about setting a table and getting to know each other um, that that's really hard to do both. It's hard to to get into accountability or to get into facts versus misinformation or to get into real content and just how important the modeling of communicating and making points and, and sharing perspectives is as a as a path and an entry point into that content. Because if you start with the content, then you're just disagreeing right away and there's no there's no path to, to follow together. So I just want to acknowledge I'm seeing a lot in the in the text, you know, that people have a lot of content they want to have brought forward and, and there's so much content, but how important it is to address other things and get to content once once that's established. Yep. Very good. Very good. Um, Maybe a final question or a comment from a panelist, if you've got one. Um, otherwise, I do. Cool. So I just want to uh, put my own um, uh, two cents in here. I learned a lot this evening. And I also, um, uh, uh, so I think we'll go ahead and, and close the chat at this point because um, we're finished with this section. Um, but I, uh, the the one, one of the comments that, um, I wanted to lift up was there were several comments about hope. And I have felt since I first began talking to the different panelists on this call that there's something special about this group and this conversation. Um, I think that this is one of the, somebody uh, in on one of our early calls mentioned that this is something that is personal for absolutely all of us. All of us have gone through the last two years. And I think that um, this evening, I just felt, uh, that through this conversation and the whole project, that there is the potential for healing in a particularly painful spot that that we really need. We really need it, and um, so I really enjoyed just experiencing that from from all of you. And I loved. Um, I mean, <laughs> this. Uh, I enjoyed the passion that was here. Um, I brave angels debate wouldn't be wouldn't be what we want without it. Um, and also the the really interesting intellectual points like area your metaphors and like the um just all of this felt like a, a symphony to me um and and one where i in a in a place in america's heart that i think really really needs some um some care so i really really uh, uh appreciate all of you for being here and and everybody for being part of this um yeah absolutely let's just give everybody one more round of jazz hands i know that there was more we could have talked about but like this is a great, great um, piece of the conversation. So just before we wrap up, um, a couple quick things. Uh, so if you liked what you saw tonight, um, then you we would love for you to be part of more of our work. Uh, you can be a part of this project. And um, so there's there will be more to come on this particular subject. And also, um, we have our next debate on May 5th. It's on labor unions. Um, and we have these every couple of weeks. And the best, we also have local alliances. So if you're somewhere and you want to meet with folks in person, with or without mask, no judgment. But um, sorry, that's a joke. <laughs> I shouldn't joke about this. I don't even know if that's okay. But um, uh, if you want to meet with people in person, there's probably something in your area. Um, and so the, uh, the way to find all of that is through our website. Um, and uh, and the, the best part to, way to be part of Braver Angels is to become a member. Um, and so I'll, I just wanna uh, clip to Paul really quickly, who's one of our, our best volunteers to, to share why, um, why this matters to you. Go ahead, Paul. You're muted. Mm, we can't hear you, sir. No, nope, we still can't hear you. Oh, well, <laughs> okay, well. Um, science fails us again. That, that's Sorry. right, it's all <laughs> science. Yes. Uh, Paul, you try to fix that. Um, uh, so we'll flip the order of this a little bit. So Paul is not only a, um, he's not only a member of Braver Angels, but he's also a volunteer. And there are a lot of people who worked really hard to make this happen tonight. And I'd like all of you volunteers to just, um, Turn on your screen so we can see your faces for a second. And yeah, we're gonna give you all a great big round of jazz hands. Um, so thank you everybody uh, for making this possible. It's a fabulous team effort um, and a lot goes into each of these. All right, Paul, do we have you yet? 
Nope. Okay. Well then, um, Luke, thank you for volunteering. Uh, tell us why you are a member of Braver Angels and why you believe in it. Well, at a very um, basic level, um, the reason I first started uh, volunteering with this, uh, this strange little organization many, many years ago, um, even though at that point I was uh, just personally trying to figure out like what my own per per uh, perfect political ideology was and what um, the right way for everybody to govern America was, right? And uh, didn't have any kind of time or use for this civil discourse stuff um, and uh, didn't really like stand in need for it. But um, I, I, a very good friend of mine um, uh, was really into it. And uh, he, he got involved with Better Angels back then and uh, asked me to, uh, to hop in and volunteer. And um, being a naturally deferential person, I was like, okay, John, I'll help out a little bit, but I'm, I'm not gonna believe it. It's, it's, it's not anything particularly real. So I did, and I helped out on one thing, and one thing turned into two things, and two things turned into 10 things. And by uh, 2018 and 2019, I was uh, suddenly volunteering in way more than I had ever imagined I ever would for a civil discourse organization. And um, the thing I realized about it is in the course of doing it, in the course of working with depolarization, in the course of assessing the depths of my own subjectivity and the place of that in the broader American sphere, I became a better conservative. Um, I became a better Republican, and I think I became a better American, not just in my ability to have conversations with uh, the liberal college students at the time who I was always getting into really bad fights with on things, not just in my ability to handle my really crazy political family members, but in understanding why exactly um, America, despite never making any sense, uh, is so beautiful in all its diversity and all its harmony and all of its uh, uh, splendor. And uh, realizing that no one of us can ever really take the whole of it, but all of us have a little part of it. And the work of depolarization, even in times of great divides, um, is just uh, a really key thing about it. So that's why I um, started uh, volunteering. I, I became staff about a year ago. Um, it is a great honor of my life to be able to do this now, but I just want to uh, make it known to everybody here. Um, and April, this is because of your leadership um, in all of this. Uh, we practice what we preach in terms of the idea that no topic is off limits and the idea that no person is off limits to engage even in times of great pain and great trauma for the nation. And we did that in the summer of 2020 and it was great. And we did that in January of 2021, it was great. And now in this latter phase of the pandemic that has transformed the world and transformed our country, we're doing it again. And if, uh, if you ask me, this was pretty great. And uh, from our beloved community to yours, from our uh, world here in Braver Angels, a world that we hope to bring to every American as time goes on uh, in service to our country that has given all of us so much, um, we invite you to uh, be with us in whatever capacity you're available to, um, to bring this to more people between now and the 2024 election and now and uh, every subsequent final presidential election in American history after the 2024 election. And uh, um, I hope that you too can realize that not only is this something that's been good for all of us, but there's something that everybody brings to it that I don't think was clear to me five years ago when I uh, went and agreed to edit one or two pieces. And uh, now I, I would never have shared it for anything in the world. So Madam Chair, thank you for having done this for us. And everybody, thank you for being a part of Braver Angels. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Luke. <laughs> also, we have people like that who give impromptu, just beautiful expressions of why America is wonderful. Um, so if that's not reason to join, I don't know what is.